I'm Juan Mandujano Sanchez. I'm a last year ortho resident, and it's an honor to me to translate for one of my professors, Dr. Hugo Vilchis. So here is his presentation. It's a pleasure to be with Harvard Global Orthopedics Collaborative for this academic session. The subject we will be discussing is evaluation of traumatic cervical injuries. My name is Hugo Vilchis Samano, and I'm the head of the Department of Spine surgery and scoliosis and the trauma and orthopedic hospital Lomas Verdes in Mexico. I have nothing to declare. We will review the statistics, initial evaluation, nexus criteria, Canadian C-spine rule and the criteria from the American College of Radiology for the evaluation of images. We will also review the clinical approach and the use of methylprednisolone in cervical trauma. Traumatic spinal cord injury is very devastating and has been established to occur at a rate of 26.5 per million inhabitants with the cervical spine affected in 52% of the cases. The average age is 59 years old. It is more frequent in men who account for 68% of total cases. Car accidents account for 29% of cases. According to Global Health Organization, around 1.3 million people died each year from car accidents. 20 to 50 million road accidents are not fatal but still leave some degree of disability. Road accidents are one of the main causes of death in the wor world with an average age between 5 to 29 years. Motorcycles, pedestrians and cyclists occupy the first places. In 2018, motorcycles represent 24% of the deaths in Latin America due to road accidents, followed by pedestrians with 22 and cyclists with 3%. This injury that we observed in the cervical spine is a C4, C5, and C6 injury presenting a C5, C6 dislocation with compromise of the spinal canal. Mexico ranks 7th in the world in this type of injury and 3rd in Latin America. Road accidents are number one cause of death in people between 5 to 29 years old and the second leading cause of death in people between 10 to 20 years old. The causes of these accidents are usually speeding, driving under the influence of alcohol or drugs, fatigue, the use of distractions on cell phones, failure to obey traffic signs, and not wearing a seatbelt or helmet. These injuries have immediate personal consequences. They will require prolonged medical assistance that generates high costs, loss of the family member who supports the family when they have a disability, loss of income for the care of the disabled person, and repercussion on the family finances. The care algorithm for these patients consists of three points. The pre-hospital system, such as ambulance and paramedics that initially attend to, and to transfer the patients, typical to a level two hospitals, which are hospitals with basic specialties, or they are transferred to level three hospitals, which are hospitals like the one we work from, which we have all the resources you need for patient care. Pre-hospital care involves mainly the use of rigid collar. The recommended ones are Aspen or Miami J collar and the spinal board, which should be pa probably be padded to avoid pressure areas. The initial evaluation of the patient, we must establish the presence or absence of cervical injury. We use advanced trauma lab support, although there are other forms of approach such as the BOST and the NICE guidelines. Here we observe the expansion of patients by two paramedics protecting the spinal spine with a rigid collar. If we want to know whether the patient needs an x-ray or not, we can use the nexus criteria for low-risk patients, where an x-ray is going to be requested in trauma patients and will not be indicated in patients who do not present pain along the posterior cervical line, who do not present with suspicions of intoxication, who are alert and conscious and don't have any neurological deficit. The Canadian C-spine rule criteria tell us if a patient over the age of 65 has paresthesias in the extremities, they need a cervical spine x-ray. If they do not have paresthesias, the next step is to ask if he tolerates sitting in the emergency room, if he's able to walk, or if the neck pain starts hour after the accident and he has no midline pain, then the patient does not need a cervical x-ray. If these criteria are met, you don't need the cervical spine x-rays. If they can perform these activities but have limited neck rotation to 45 degrees on the left and the right, you need to obtain a cervical spine x-ray. The appropriateness criteria of the ACR tell us that when image is recommended by the nexus system or the C-spine rule, they recommend obtaining an x-ray and a CT without contrast.
when cervical spinal cord or nerve root injury with or without traumatic cause of is confirmed, it is usually appropriate to order an MRI. If you already have the diagnosis and are planning treatment or if the spine is unstable, it is appropriate to request a simple MRI of the cervical spine. In patients with arterial injury and the level of cervical spine, it is appropriate to request a CT or a construct head MRI to determine the injury and map out an approach. Next, we have the clinical algorithm. The clinical algorithm is divided into four stages. Question and physical examination is number one, followed by the classification of the lesion with the ISNCSC. Number three, imaging studies. And finally, the definitive manage of the lesion, lesions. In our center, we have the, this admission model for traumatic spinal injuries. It's a PowerPoint file that contains information that must be extracted from the patient or paramedics and the flowchart that must be followed for the physical exam and to establish the diagnosis and treatment of each patient. Thus, the treatment of the patient is carried out in an orderly, consistent manner. This file contains information for the study to the orthopedic reasoning, spine surgery referrals, and those handling orthopedic care in the ER. It consists, consists of general patient information, such as age, gender, occupation, medical history, and history that includes allergies, last medications, disease, or past medical history, last meal, and events that led to the injury. We must document the date and the time of onset of the injury, the date and the time of the arrival to the ER, to determine if the patient is being treated within the first eight hours, and if so, to evaluate the use of methylprednisolol. We must ask if the patient was another unit and what treatments he has given. Again, how the accident happened and did they have any other injuries to consider if they are polytrauma patients. The initial physical examination must include an updated vital signs and the ABCDE evaluation from the advanced trauma life support. Within the neurological examination, a rapid neuro neurological examination can be carried out using the speed classifications used in Australia. It consists of dorsiflexion of the foot. We touch the malleolus side and the sternum. We ask them to shake hands with us and ask if they have pain in any region of the body. A classification from one to two is given with zero being complete injury, two being normal. With this scale, we can evaluate the patient in less than one minute and determine if he has a neurological injury. The physical exam or secondary examination is carried out by the orthopedist. Once life-threatening injuries have been ruled out, we proceed to carry out an evaluation of neurological injury using the AC scale of the International Standards for Neuro Neurological Classification of Spinal Cord Injury, where we can examine precisely other methods for fine touch, gross touch, left side and right side and motor areas to establish an appropriate classification and see the level where the neuro neurological lesion is located. This tool is available digitally and can be used online and in print for the medical record. What we need to know is the patient has ACA, which is normal, or ACA, which represents a complete spinal cord injury, as a BCD, which is considered an incomplete injury. To assess gross and fine sensation, we use these two tools on the right, being two normal, one different to the other side, and zero without sensation. The key points according to the AHA classification are C2 retroolicular, C3 trapezius, C4 shoulder, C5 inner arm, C6 finger, first finger, C7 third finger, C8 fifth finger, T1 inner elbow, C2 axilla, and L1 inner thigh, L2 anterior area of the thigh, L3 knee, L4 media malleolus, L5 the dorsum of the foot, S1 lateral area of the foot, S2 posterior part of the knee, and S4 and S5 perianal region. The anal sphincter is also examined by digital rectal examination to assess the sphincter tone and contraction. The bulbar cavern of reflex is done with the Foley catheter. For the motor evaluation, we have the cervical area and the lumbar area, and here we have the key muscles that are explained below. For C5, the patient is asked to flex the elbow. For C6, wrist extension. C7, elbow extension. C8, compression of the fingers. And T1, abduction of the fingers. L1 and 2, flexion of the hip and thigh. L3, extension of the knee. L4, dorsiflexion of the foot. L5, dorsiflexion of the thumb. And S1, plantar flexion. 
To assess reflex, we have C5, bicipital reflex, C6, insupinate and muscle, C7, triceps reflex, L2, L4, kick reflex, and S1, Achilles reflex. Imaging studies require an AP and lateral X-ray of the cervical spine that can be viewed up to T1. A transoral X-ray and swimmer's view can be requested. On some occasions, the patient anatomy or in injuries will not allow to obtain an adequate lateral cervical radiograph. It is important to see the C7 T1 translation transition because cervical lesion in this region can be missed. Sometimes the patient enters the operating room immediately and is later admitted to the ICU and we do not know the real neuro neurological status of the patient. A spinal CT scan without x-ray may be requested if above case of course. In our institution and in some other body CT is performed in patients with multiple suspected lesions. In this study, the whole body is observed, making it more difficult to miss some lesion. Time is gained for treatment, but the cost is high, which is a specific indication must be followed, such as the patient with multiple injuries and unsta unstable patients. In this radiograph, we can observe a poor radiographic technique, and when performing the CT, we see a lesion at the level of C2, and, the, and a lesion of C71 is ruled out. This is an example of a transoral radiograph to observe C1 and C2. In the image of the right, we can see the swimmer's view for C71 is observed without any issues. In cervical radiograph, we must observe from C2 to T1. This is a good radiograph. We must visualize the integrity of the lines of the anterior and posterior longitudinal ligaments that indicate if there are any type of stasis. We also look at interdiscal space and we also look at the anatomy of the vertebral bodies. We also observe the interlaminar line that defines together with the orange line. The area of the facets, the white line is the interspinous line. We must observe the line canal that sits between the orange and the yellow lines. Do not forget that retropharyngeal space, since there are injuries that can be cause of bleeding and an increased volume in the retropharyngeal space. We can compromise the airway. In the anterior posterior radio, we observe the alignment of the spinous process and the alignment of the facet. We also look at the trachea or air column to assess retropharyngeal or pulmonary injuries that can displace the airway and endanger the patient's life. We are going to present two cases. In the first case, we could not obtain plain radiograph. It is a patient who had a car accident with an injury to the head cervical spine and chest. A sagittal slice CT shows a complete C6, C7 dislocation obstructing more than 90% of the spinal canal. This patient underwent fluoroscopy guided cervical traction reduction surgery. The patient was Asia A from C7 to distal as shown in the image on the left. Subsequent instrumentation was performed. The patient arrived eight hours after the accident, so methylprednisolone was not used. The second case is a 30-year-old male who arrives walking. AP and lateral radiograph show a dislocation of C2 and C3 with involvement of the spinal canal and lateralization of the head to the right side. A CT scan was performed when C2-C2 lesion was corroborated. MRI showed a spinal cord integrity. It was classified as a C2-C2 lesion without neurological compromise, Asia E. Methylprednisolone was not used and surgery was performed in two stages. The first consisting of posterior reduction and instrumentation with facet screws. The second stage consists of a C3, C2 disectomy and fusion with a self-supporting cage. We will not talk about methylprednisolone. Sodium succinate. It is one of the few medications that have shown a slight improvement at the neurological level in patients with a complete spinal cord injury. Its usefulness has not been seen in patients with complete spinal cord injury. In patients with com incomplete spinal cord injury, it has shown that they improve slightly. The use of methylprednisolone for patients with a complete injury and also for medical legal issues in different cases is analyzed. These are three current recommendations established and analyzed by the group of Dr. Fillings in Toronto, published in the Global Spine Journal of 2017. The first one, a 24-hour infusion of methylprednisolone is suggested in an adult patient with spinal cord injury who is treated within the first eight hours of spinal injury with a moderate quality of evidence and weak recommendation strength. 
Number two, it is not suggested to offer the medication to a patient eight hours after the injury. And number three, it is not suggested to offer the medication for more than 24 hours because in one of the NASA studies on which these recommendations are based, I saw that they were more likely to have pneumonia or sepsis. In conclusion, it is recommended for patients treated in the first eight hours of the injury. The infusion should be last no more than 24 hours. Doses are 30 milligrams of ki or per kilogram of that weight for the first hour, followed by 5.4 milligram per kilogram of body weight over the next 23 hours. In conclusion, spinal cord injury is common in the world and will cause different types of disability based on the classification injuries. It occurs in young patients of productive age and has an impact on the family economy and the physiological and labor spheres. Initial evaluation will include the Nexus criteria and the Canadian C-spine rule and recommendation of the ACR. It is essential to carry out a detailed clinical history and an adequate physical exam to rule out other associated injuries such as abdominal, brain, and maxillary injuries. Do not forget that we must classify the presenting neurological lesion through the different tools such as the one of Asia from the ISNCSC. Always observe the C71 area because up to 20% 20, 20 of the time we can miss a lesion at this level due to inadequate radiography. Use CT and MR as recommended. Use methylprednisolone in patients with incomplete spinal cord injury seen within the first eight hours and no longer than 24 hours. With this, we finish and it has been a pleasure to speak with you all today. Thank you very much and have a good day.